All right, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Exploring the Complexities of Grief and Supporting Those Who gr Are Grieving. Um, my name is Danielle Daly. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator here with the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network. I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping things and then I will pass on off to Katie and Kaylee for their presentation. As a reminder, everyone is muted and your cameras are disabled. Please use that chat box to interact throughout the presentation. You can also use the Q&A um, to ask questions to make sure that those don't get lost in that chat box. Um, you know, please be sure to interact throughout the training, um, whether that's providing your experience, questions, um, resources, anything of that sort. Uh, please visit our website, icpn.org. Um, you can view all of our upcoming trainings on there, as well as view some of our past ones that have been recorded. Um, it'll link you to our YouTube page. You can also sign up to be on our mailing list um, so that you'll have that firsthand knowledge of when those um, registration opens for new webinars. Um, continuing education certificates, give me about 14 days to get those out to everyone. Um, we do have a lot of people on today, so it will take some time to get those out. It will come to the email address that you registered with, so by clicking on the link that you received for the webinar, you are accounted for today. Um, so please be patient with me. Give me about 14 days. If for some reason you do not receive it in that 14 day time period, after the fact, um, please send me an email. I will put my email into the um, chat box, but it is ddaily at hope.us. Um, I believe that is all I have. I'll put all the information into the chat box for you. Um, but Katie and Kaylee, you guys can go ahead. Hello there. So um, Kaylee and I have um, worked on a lot of cases for um, with individuals who have been struggling with grief. So we felt like um, we would be a good team to present this topic. Um, what we will be reviewing today is um, why we grieve, um, types of grief, suicide and grief, stages of grief, trauma and grief, observ observable signs and symptoms, and how we can help different ideas for resources. Um, some reasons for why we grieve, um, loss of a loved one due to death, loss of a pet, um, someone moving away. Um, for our individuals living in different residential settings, um, having staff changes, um, losing a job or other major life changes that are kind of out of our control, um, or just a loss of like a lifelong dream or hope that um, is not being fulfilled. And then um, we can also think of like anticipatory grief when there's like an illness or an expected um, passing of someone. And um, one of the topics too that um, has brought up in our research of grief is that even like a famous person who, you know, you have felt some kind of affinity for, um, you know, they talk about Robin Williams or, you know, Kurt Cobain, or um, there's, there's a lot of people that have touched our lives that um, you can feel a sense of loss if they have passed away. Um, we put some pictures on here. I put that's my cat Pepper, and she is about 16, we think, um, years old, and she is getting up there in age and moving slow, but she is um, definitely an animal that I'm very bonded with, and so that's kind of my anticipatory grief. Like, I am always watching out for her and seeing how she's doing, because um, I know that day is coming. So, Kaylee, you want to share about your guy there? Sure. So, that's Gabe. Um, I actually had him since eighth grade and he just passed away this year. So I had him for about 16 to 17 years. Um, and he kind of went through like all of the crazy experiences that you go through in life with, um, high school and college and, you know, even moving out. Um, so, you know, it was definitely something that, you know, we were expecting because he was starting to get old and um, he was blind and couldn't really see very well or walk very well. Um, but it's still, you know, not easy when you do see them age and kind of start to go on to their next chapter. Um, 
And then one of the types um, of grief that we'll talk about um, is prolonged grief disorder. Um, and it is explained in the DSM-5 as an individual who may experience some sort of intense longing for the person who has died or preoccupation with thoughts of that person. Um, so in both children and adolescents, the preoccupation may focus on the circumstances around the death um, and they may experience um, significant distress or problems performing daily activities at home, work, school, or other important areas in their life. The persistent grief is disabling, and it really does affect everyday functioning in a way that typical grieving does not. Um, for a diagnosis of prolonged grief disorder, the loss of a loved one who had to have had to have occurred at least a year ago for adults and at least six months ago for children and adolescents. Um, in addition, the grieving individual must have experienced at least three of the symptoms that we'll go over on the next page for at least the last month um, prior to the diagnosis. Um, so here's some symptoms of prolonged grief disorder, um, identity disruption. So that's kind of feeling as though part of um, yourself has died um, when that person who did die pass, um, a marked sense of disbelief about the death. Um, so, and then avoidance of reminders that that person is dead. So, you know, maybe not going to their favorite store um, that they used to go, that you used to go to with them. Um, intense emotional pain, such as anger, bitterness, sorrow, that's related to the death. Difficulty with reintegration, so problems with engaging with friends or pursuing interests or even planning for the future. Some emotional numbness, um, so marked reduction of emotional experience, um, feeling like life is, is meaningless, intense loneliness, um, feeling detached from others or feeling like you're alone in the grief. Um, and then in addition, the person's bereavement lasts longer than what might be expected based on the social, cultural or religious norms. Um, another type of grief that um that we found in our research is delayed grief. Um, delayed grief are people who are at higher risk for delayed grief um, are people who have often suffered from other um, types of trauma or loss um, or mental health issues, um, depression, PTSD. Um, and those who um, are at risk for suffering from delayed grief, um, the risk goes up for those who have a more sudden death and are not able to kind of have that expected anticipatory preparedness for seeing that it's coming. Um, and so oftentimes it can be very shocking to lose someone. And um, so as listed here in like the examples of some of the symptoms, um, so intense sadness, um, numbness, brain fog, insomnia, isolation, anxiety, um, narrowed focus on the loss or extreme focus on, on reminders of the loved one um, or excessive avoidance. Um, so it can go either way. And then um, intense longing, trouble accepting the death. So kind of denial, um, and this is all kind of exact, like not exaggerated, but like more extreme than like you would um, say is the same um, symptoms for like a typical grieving person. That's why it's kind of categorized differently. Um, and a lot of these feelings of apathy and disassociation where they just, it's too painful, so they're not going to deal with it. Um, complicated grief. Um, so normal grief sy symptoms, usually, you know, over time you start to um, learn how to cope better with the grief and um, be able to, you know, find ways of making yourself feel better um, each day. However, with complicated grief, um, it lingers, it gets worse. It's, um, you know, there's just really intense mourning and it keeps you from being able to, to heal and to, to start to feel better. So um, a lot of these symptoms are very similar. And so I think that it would be very um, complicated to, um, to diagnose someone. However, um, you know, these are noted, um, 
you know, differences that they find in studying different people and grieving. So um, someone who's experiencing complicated grief, they focus on little else but the death of the loved one. They have intense sorrow. Um, they're, that's all they're focusing on. They um, have the intense longing and feeling bitter, angry, um, a lot of problems accepting the death, or they're feeling numb and detached, um, feeling that, you know, life is meaningless and just feeling that they don't have the ability to um, think back on, you know, the times of like the good times with a positive regard. Um, they're mainly just focused on the sadness. Um, grief in our brain and memory. Um, so during um, preparation for this, um, which is in the resources at the end, I read this book um, and it discusses, you know, um, the grieving brain is a title and it discusses how our brain functions um, as far as learning new things and um, how we process grief from like, like a um, neurologist point of view and how we, um, you know, when we are born, as we grow, we learn object permanence, right? We learn that, you know, even if, you know, mom leaves the room, that she'll come back. And um, when, so that's kind of, you know, reinforced over the years and then you know suddenly someone is gone and you know they're not there and there's no way to reach them and so it is a new relearning it is having to remap our we have these memories and these associations and these expected connections and so we have to relearn how we view the world how we experience the world if it's you know someone that is really that um, that much a part of our life. Um, and then in the brain here, it, um, points out the prefrontal cortex, um, the thinking center of the brain that is under, underactive, the anterior cingulate cortex, the emotional regulation center of the brain is underactive. So that's kind of like that depressive disassociative. And the amygdala is the fear center of the brain that can become overactive because we are getting, we can be triggered into that, you know, fight, flight or freeze um, or fawn and um, dealing with, you know, feeling unsafe and um, not sure how to handle um, the situation. So we are um, struggling to relearn how we deal with uh, our daily life. Um, and then there's a lot of, you know, effects on, on the physical health. Um, you know, grieving is very stressful. Um, and as we all know, stress can impact our physical health immensely. Um, and so that can kind of look like aches and pains, um, chest pains, or feeling like your heart is racing. Um, exhaustion or trouble sleeping. There could be headaches, dizziness, or shaking. Um, some people exhibit high blood pressure, muscle tension or jaw clenching, um, stomach or digestive problems, and then weakened immune system. Um, and, uh, and then this can obviously leave you more vulnerable to contagious diseases. Um, and how you feel your grief physically can mimic the ways your body has responded to stress and other situations too. Um, so kind of how Katie talked about um, the grief in our brain and memory, um, you know, it does have a lot of effects on our mental health. Um, scientists are increasingly viewing the experience of traumatic loss as a type of brain injury. Um, the brain does rewire itself, um, and this is called neuroplasticity, and it's in response to emotional trauma, which has profound effects on the brain, mind, and body. Um, after a loss, the body releases hormones and some chemicals that are reminiscent of a fight, flight, or freeze, like Katie was talking about, um, and that's the response. So reminders of the loss trigger a stress response, and then this response remodels the brain's circuitry. Um, this causes the pathways that you relied on for most of your life, like, you know, um, maybe if it is a loved one, like, 
for example, your mother, you know, calling your mom every day or calling someone when they're, when you're super excited about something and then, you know, having that realization that they're no longer here for you to, you know, tell them all of the exciting things and um, just kind of having, it is mostly, you know, temporary detours, um, but it is still um, something that, you know, those pathways that have relied on, that you've relied on for most of your life um, to kind of take a different route. Um, and so research has shown that these cognitive effects are more pronounced among people who have complicated grief. Um, and that condition strikes about 10% of bereaved people and is marked by an intense yearning for the deceased. Um, and people with complicated grief experience greater cognitive decline over a seven year study period compared with those with a less complicated grief response. Um, and this was a, according to a 2008 study um, pub published in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. Um, our brains have trouble processing the re reasons for the death of a loved one. And so even making up explanations for it, um, this can kind of lead us down a rabbit hole of what ifs and if onlys, um, especially if we are stuck in that grief. And then that little graph there, um, it just, I thought it was very interesting because um, it does show there like up to a third of people who suffer a major loss. Um, so from the death of a child or, or a spouse, um, they will suffer that um, detrimental effect on their physical or mental health. Um, we wanted to discuss the stages of grief and um, how we know there's this common understanding of the grief cycle, going through denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. <clears throat> um, I hope I don't mess up her name, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, from 1969. She kind of developed this. And my understanding is that she um, worked with terminally ill individuals and kind of saw this pattern of, um, you know, what they went through when they were dealing with their um, coming death. And so um, they kind of made this, theory that this is kind of what everybody goes through. However, um, it's not just a pattern like that. This is more, you know, the chaos of grief of, you know, there's no, we all probably feel those things, but it's not just a pattern that goes from, <clears throat> oh, now I, I'm in denial and then I go to anger and I'm not going to ever go back to den denial again. Um, and then I finally accepted it. So I'm over grieving. I'm done. Like, it's not that easy. We go through um, all of these different feelings in no, un no sensible pattern or um, nothing that, you know, makes sense. It's just chaos of our feelings. And, you know, sometimes... Um, you think that you have, you know, gone through and kind of processed a certain level of grief and then, man, it just smacks you right back and you're like, you know, right back where you used to be. So um, it's definitely not a clear cut steps in healing from grief. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to touch on suicide and grief that... Um, a lot of people struggle with thoughts of suicide after losing someone who is very important to them. And um, we've worked with many clients um, who have, you know, lost parents, um, lost family, either they're, um, whether they were still connected to them or not. Um, and like we've worked with individuals who would make comments of, you know, I just want to go with my mom and dad to heaven. What is the point of this life? Um, I can't take this life anymore. I don't want to be here. We had a client who said, I just want to go be with Jesus. Um, we, you know, making these comments, just expressing themselves of their, you know, how they're, they're grieving and they're feeling this sadness and depression and, this is their way of processing through it. And it's not to be taken lightly, but it's also part of the process. Um, so, you know, it's okay to not be okay. You know, we're all struggling. We're all <clears throat> um, dealing with our own 
challenges and feelings. And, um, but we wanted to kind of bring that up that there are the resources out there and um, the 988 um, suicide crisis lifeline that um, has just been, you know, it's fairly new that it's a national calling center, um, easier to remember. Um, and we want to encourage at least people to talk about it. Um, it's a myth, you know, that if you talk about suicide to someone or you like allow them to talk to you about it, that that's going to encourage it it's more likely to let them work through those thoughts and feelings and validating, you know, that, oh gosh, I'm sorry that you feel so, so upset. And it's understandable that you feel so sad um, and encourage them to get help um, rather than saying, don't talk like that. That's not a good way to talk. Um, that would more encourage them to shut down and not talk about it, which can be really dangerous um, because they may, you know, act on it without getting help. Um, so some different factors that affect how a person um, may experience grief is um, their level of resilience, which we gain over life, um, our emotional intelligence, and are they, is the person able to express their emotions in healthy ways? Do they have coping skills? Are they aware of how to use them? Um, are they self-aware enough to know how they're feeling? Are they just kind of blocking themselves from it and not like, you know, being self-aware to, to be able to express how they're feeling? Um, do they have people in their life that are checking in with them? Um, <clears throat> and do they have other things in their life? Like if there's additional stressors, you know, if you have lost someone and you're grieving, which you know, is often the case, you know, say you have a loved one that passed away and then you have to deal with, you know, all of the planning and the, um, you know, dealing with the estate and legal issues and, you know, other family involvement. Um, and for thinking of our individuals, you know, um, their challenges may be that they don't, have like a connection to be able to go and, you know, um, visit people or be as much a part of things as they want, or, um, you know, what, what are the things that, that they're dealing with in addition to just, you know, losing that one person? Um, and what do they understand about death and loss? Um, have they had time to ask questions and understand, um, what it means and, is there a way to help them process this information? Um, and also like taking into consideration the circumstances of the death. So was it abrupt? You know, was it expected? Did they have time to grieve a little bit beforehand? Did they, you know, were they able to say goodbye? Um, was it tragic and like a horrible accident? Um, and um, were they able to kind of get a sense of closure? So um, this little um, picture of the dogs here, I love this um, because, you know, there, we can all go through things differently. Um, you know, there's people who have, you know, struggled with grief. Um, I'd say, you know, that's something just to share, like both Kaylee and I have had, you know, a lot of loss in our lives. And so, I feel like we have um, a certain understanding of how we grieve and how we've been able to work through that. And other people who have maybe never experienced the level of loss and grief, um, and it's new to them, that would be really intense to experience. And that is very intense. So someone who has those that resilience and those the understanding of themselves already, would it would be you know, it's not easy, but it's, um, you're able to kind of handle yourself better than someone who has never experienced that, um, strong of a loss before. Um, and then, you know, um, just that feeling grief, um, may not ever go away, but we just carry it differently, um, as time goes on. Um, and then going into trauma and grief, um, 
trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. Um, Gabor Mate um, is a author on trauma. And um, this is, I just feel like it's connected with what I was just talking about, that it's not about what happens to you because, you know, something can happen to one person. Someone can get into a car accident and it's like, oh, okay, you know, I feel okay and it's not traumatic, but another person gets into the same car accident and they have, you know, horrible, you know, bad dreams or they're affected by it differently. And so it's individualized. It doesn't matter, you know, how traumatic or, you know, um, how you interpret the situation, it matters how they are dealing with it and what's happening. Um, traumatic experiences include experiencing the death of a loved one, witnessing an event happening to others, learning that a loved one experienced a violent or accidental traumatic event, um, and then repeated exposure to the outcomes of traumatic events, such as, um, you know, ambulance, um, EMTs, police, um, you know, any kind of emergency responder. And then, you know, those who have been through um, abuse as children. Um, and honestly, in this population, we, we have a lot of people who have dealt with various kinds of abuse. So, you know, thinking about when you're dealing with something that's already emotional and traumatic and that gets brought up. And then a lot of times some of that past stuff comes back to you too, because when you're dealing with something traumatic and hard, it's kind of like that, like Kayla was talking about that um, connection, connection in the brain, you know, a lot of that can trigger past memories that have a similar connection to it. Um, I felt this way about this situation. And so um, I remember, a past situation where I felt similarly. And so some of that stuff can come rushing back at you and um, it can just make it that much harder to deal with. Did you wanna stop for questions? Yes, we had two questions come through. Um, the first one was related to delayed grief. So um, Nancy asked if if refusing medication and taking care of, of themselves could be a symptom of delayed grief. I think it could be um, if they're just not wanting to be, you know, a part of like if they're isolating themselves and not really joining in and like their normal routines and activities, I think that that could definitely, you know, be a part of it and refusing to take care of themselves could definitely be, you know, a sign of that. Um, and then Tracy had a great question. Um, she was curious if, um, if this is found only in grief over death, or if this can be grief related to like the loss of a friend, a loved one um, that doesn't necessarily die, um, maybe the loss of a home, um, for example, moving out of a home with um, like out, not their choice, um, things, situations of that nature. Absolutely. Yes. Um, any of those things, it absolutely um, can trigger those, those feelings of grief. I that looks like that's all that we had thus far. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right, then we'll go ahead and jump into um, the grief-related observable signs and symptoms. Um, so um, the three categories, um, depression, denial, anger. Um, so with the depression, you know, feeling sad or having a depressed mood, um, maybe loss of interest or pleasure in activities that you once enjoyed. Um, changes in appetite, so whether that's weight loss or gain, um, trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, loss of energy or increased fatigue. Um, with that denial piece, uh, feeling numb or shocked, being confused and disoriented, shutting down, unable to process um, any of the emotions, forgetting about the loss, avoiding reminders of the loss, um, kind of similar to what we talked about um, in that prolonged grieving. Um, sleeping more than usual, procrastinating, dealing with the loss and its consequences, um, staying busy all the time to avoid thinking about the loss and not really processing and working through 
um, the loss, questioning why things, and then with anger, um, questioning why things have happened, and then control-seeking behaviors. Katie, next slide. Thank you. Um, and then just some therapeutic interventions um, used to help process grief that we'll cover. Um, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Um, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, so EMDR. Um, music therapy, and then some bereavement support groups. Um, so EMDR or eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy um, assists the individual to process upsetting memories, thoughts, and feelings related to their trauma. Um, this method is different from other trauma-focused therapies um, because it does not it does not incorporate extended exposure to the traumatic memory um, or require you to go into detailed descriptions of what happened in the event. Um, different types of psychotherapies. Um, so treatments aim to reduce symptoms, but not directly by targeting thoughts, memories, and feelings related to the traumatic event. Um, and then these can include um, just some supportive therapy, motivational interviewing, art therapy, music therapy that we'll discuss on the next page, um, sand therapy, and then practicing relaxation, visualization, and mindfulness. So music therapy and bereavement support. Um, so music therapy, it's an allied health profession and it's clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship. Um, this is done by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. Um, and this can be used through all stages of grief. Um, so they kind of work to make it be an effective medium to meet individuals where they are at in their healing process. Um, and they'll create an individualized care plan that will facilitate some healthy, healthy coping strategies and ease some of that suffering. Um, they may be centered around various goals, including emotional expression, so when, you know, that verbal supportive environment, um, or that, I'm sorry, that verbal communication surrounding personal subjects may be difficult. Um, music in a supportive environment can help externalize inner emotions through projective methods. Um, so it could be music listening and lyric analysis. Um, so that's, you know, when they don't have their words of their own, but they may find them in a song, um, some clinical improvisation. So music making with instruments or voice, um, songwriting. Um, this is a pretty big technique um, used to promote um, some of that externalization of thoughts and memories. And you can even do like some fill in the blank um, songwriting um, that can provide cueing to allow for greater ease of expression. Um, some coping skills. Um, so passive music listening, um, that is more along the lines of maybe, you know, they'll kind of play a song and kind of seek that validation through the song lyrics and melody and kind of come up with some different memories that they once had. Um, and that kind of goes right into that reminiscence there. Um, so active music listening and discussion um, is a key thing that they do during that. So choosing and listening to meaningful songs for a client. Um, and then they can discuss, you know, what is reminiscent of that song? You know, is it dancing in the kitchen with your loved one during this song? Um, or maybe this was your first wedding song, or this was your song that your mom used to sing to you all the time. Um, and then another one of those goals could be mood. Um, so instrument playing, um, music therapists may use a variety of instruments, including drums, maracas for structured playing or improvisation. Um, singing, the act of singing releases some endorphins and may act as another medium of self-expression. Um, but each person's treatment methods are determined based on their preference and level of ability, um, as well as the service provider's recommendations. Um, so medications um, and the depressants are often used to manage, help manage some of those symptoms. So reducing depression and anxiety, as well as assist with improved sleep. Um, oftentimes, there is a combination of medication and psychotherapy that is used. 
Um, and then individuals with IDD or ASD um, and communication challenges um, typically have more challenges with expressing their experiences, um, kind of like Katie talked about, you know, or being able to process their feelings and understanding, you know, what actually occurred and, you know, what it does mean to them. It may take them more time to process those thoughts and feelings and really understand what is going on. Um, so therapists may need to work more slowly with these clients and um, dis and develop some creative methods for the client to learn um, to express their feelings, which we'll get into. Um, so grief can be a lifelong process. Um, there are many different things that can trigger um, those feelings to come back. So riding in the car, like Kay Kaylee was just talking about riding in the car and listening to music and then a certain song comes on and it can just bring it all rushing back. Um, part of the process of working through those moments is recognizing when that's happening and accepting it and um, being able to respect and honor, you know, those feelings. Um, and then you know, some, one of the other things that um, grief can bring up is those thoughts of your own mortality and those that you love around you. Um, I get, well, one of the things that um, I've seen people do is, you know, when they've experienced a loss um, as a child, they, they wear things from that person. They carry certain memories with them. They, you know, want to carry their purse or they want to wear their shirt or um, to keep them close. And um, they may worry about, well, you know, my, my mom died. I'm, you know, is dad going to get sick too? Um, it is my sister, my brother, my, you know, my other, the other people closer to me. So, um, you know, or, you know, in the case of like our individuals working in different settings, you know, they have a lot of people in and out of their lives. It can, you know, trigger a lot of feelings of loss. Like, um, like the question that somebody had brought up, um, about can this sense of grief go towards, you know, living situations in residential facilities and moving unexpectedly or, you know, changes in your life situation that you have no control over. Absolutely. That's, we all experience those feelings of loss, loss and grief, like when we don't have control over, you know, if you, um, you know, if your company shuts down and you lose your job, you know, that's a huge, um, that would be a huge loss. And you would feel that sense of grief and go through all of those feelings. Um, so um, how can we help those who are grieving? Um, a lot of, so I feel like it's kind of newer, but um, something that people have been talking about is holding space. And so I wanted to kind of find something that explained that. And I found this quote um, and I'll just read it here. Um, holding space means to be with someone without judgment, to donate your ears and heart without wanting anything back, to practice empathy and compassion, to accept someone's truth, no matter what they are, <clears throat> to allow and accept, embrace with two hands instead of pointing with one finger, to come in neutral, open for them, not you. Holding space means to put your needs and opinions aside and allow someone to just be their own self. Um, and I feel like that is the perfect, you know, you're not trying to fix anything. You're not giving like ideas or examples. You can be there and just listen. And, um, and based like through that listening, maybe you can find out, you know, or ask them like, what can I do? Um, but holding space is a huge, a huge help, I think, for a, a lot of people. And um, especially for our folks who um, I feel like venting, you know, just getting it out. A lot of times you just need to speak things and it loses their power. So just being there and hearing them and validating their feelings. Um, so we have some case examples we wanted to discuss about how um, 
we have worked with some different individuals um, to support them when they have been dealing with um, grief and loss. So um, this first one is um, Sean, and we got permission to be able to talk about him and use, you know, his first name and um, we have um, to share his story. Um, so Sean lost multiple loved ones in a short span of time. Um, his mother, his stepfather, and his biological father all passed away. And some family members, um, some of them, it was like a longer process. I believe his mom had had a stroke and was in a nursing home. And then um, other deaths were more sudden and unexpected. Um, and so he had been expressing, you know, for some time about how much he missed them. And he would talk about, you know, them being in heaven and him having dreams about them and how he really missed them. And he missed his mom's house. And, um, so at times he, <clears throat> he exhibits aggression and, um, will like verbally, you know, start agitating people and him being agitated himself. Um, and, you know, that was why, you know, one of the reasons why um, we, as the support services team, were referred to working with him and um, trying to help him to process some of this grief and to understand his feelings um, and learn on, learn, teach him to use coping skills. Um, so some of the things that we did, this is Sean, we made some um, photo collages with his family members. Um, we talked about his favorite memories and kind of wrote them down um, so that, you know, he could always look at that and kind of be like, oh yeah, like this memory, that was one of my, my favorite ones. And then, um, you know, just listen to him about how much he misses them and what, um, you know, what he, what he misses about them and, you know, try to just listen to him and process through that. Um, we made a dream journal for him um, and then, you know, practicing different coping skills and learning how to, to express his emotions, his frustration, his anger, his sadness in healthier ways than what he was able to at the time, because it seemed like he would be <clears throat> very overwhelmed in moments. Um, so, yeah, that was Sean. Um and then going on to Q's story, um, Q's story is one that um, is, you know, is one of ones that like stuck out to me. Um, so he's been in and out of residential since he's a teenager. Um, he was very close with his mom um, and they would visit. And, um, he had a lot of good memories with her. Um, but he, she had moved to a nursing home. She got ill and then, um, and then the pandemic came and she couldn't come visit and he couldn't go visit her. And then, um, there was a terrible accident at the nursing home and she suddenly passed away. And so, and that was <clears throat> his link, excuse me, <clears throat> <clears throat> that was his link to his family. He didn't have connections with other family. Um, and so he did, and he didn't have any photographs. He had no photos of his mom or, you know, he talks about his aunt and his grandma often too, and he misses them. And, um, you know, we, um, we tried to look online for information. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very hard when like there's individuals that have no visual, you know, memories that they can like look at. And I know as someone who has lost like family, you know, as a young, young person, um, being afraid of, I'm going to forget their voice. I'm going to forget what they look like. You know, um, I just feel like that's very sad to me that he has no pictures of any of his family. Um, so he expresses symptoms of depression, hopelessness, loneliness, and there's, you know, he gets very upset, um, 
feeling that staff don't care about him, feeling that uh, no one truly loves him or cares for him like his mom did. And he would exhibit for verbal aggression, elopement, um, property destruction. And at times he, um, he can be, you know, aggressive and making comments about how nobody cares about him. So who cares what happens, you know, to him and who cares what he does because nobody cares about him. So that's a very deep seated feeling of hopelessness that he has there that, um, is, you know, just very hard to, to deal with. Um, so what are we able to do? You know, we're practicing different coping skills with him. Um, we're just kind of honoring his memories. Um, he talked about some camping trips and some um, specific locations where he had gone to have fun times at a lake with his family and they grilled out on the beach. And so I was able to look for a picture of that lake online. And I found a picture of that lake and kind of wrote, um, you know, the memories down for him, typed them out and printed it and brought it to him. And so it was like, okay, he has something that can bring some memories back, you know? Um, and then kind of practicing positive thinking, changing his focus, because the, the reality is, no, staff don't care. Like staff are not like, it's not that they don't care about you. They do care about you. You know, it's kind of that perspective and that negativity and how you're perceiving things. So kind of working on um, positive thinking and changing his focus and realizing that, you know, sometimes people are, you know, trying to help you to do the right thing. And that's their way of showing that they care and that they're trying to, you know, watch out for you. And then um, self-care affirmations that he does matter and people do care about him. And just once again, changing that positive thinking um, or his negative thinking into positive thinking. Um, we've all also worked on some visualization techniques to kind of help him to, to be able to go to um, like a better, calmer place and to kind of um, help him to relax himself in times when he needs to do that. And then A's story. Um, so this was a client that Katie and I actually had together. Um, and she was one of the first clients that I had that I actually did um, this with. Um, and she has just had a history just filled with trauma, abuse, neglect, and, and loss. Um, she was living in a residential setting, um, but her family lived quite quite a ways away. Um, and so she wasn't really able to see them often. Um, really, I mean, she was able to kind of keep that relationship um, over the phone when her mom would call every night or, you know, even her siblings. Um, and she still does have a relationship, you know, with her mom and her siblings um, through phone calls. Um, but she had a sister who she was relatively close to who was killed in a horrible violent accident um, just a few months before we started working with her. And she really did speak about this often. Um, I, I mean, really to anyone who would listen, um, she would often, you know, cry um, and, you know, just she just really needed to process this grief as well as this loss that she had. Um, and although she was able to go um, to the funeral and see her family in person, um, you know, it, it still it was still a lot for her to process and go through. Um, and, you know, she would be angry at, at the house and um, it just kind of seemed out of nowhere and staff were really not understanding of, you know, they understood that she had lost, but they lost her sister, but they weren't understanding why she was as angry as she was. Um, and so she really did speak um, about her loss and feelings um, with the staff and let them know why she was feeling the way she was. But um, again, it, she really did appear to struggle with knowing what to do with those feelings and how to move forward. Um, and so we 
she didn't have many pictures of her sister. Um, and so Katie and I kind of, you know, looked and we did find um, some photos of her sister. Um, and we helped her make a photo collage of her sister so that she could have that and hang in her room. Um, or, I mean, if she, if she wanted to, she, you know, she could take it with her, um, you know, two day program. Um, but I believe she ended up hanging it in her room. Um, above her bed. Um, and then we made a memory board. Um, and so, you know, she was able to write down some of her favorite memories with her sisters so that she wasn't focusing on that, you know, horrible, tragic event that ended her sister's life, but instead, you know, some of the memories that she had with her sister and um, what, what they did together, you know, when she was living there or when she was able to come and visit her. Um, we read about loss um, and you know, when bad things happen um, and kind of processed and talked about that. And then, you know, we also spoke about other people who have had some similar experiences and what others do to help them feel better and kind of brainstormed with her, you know, on some things that she could do that could help her make, that could help her feel better. Um, she had a locket um, of her sister's picture on it, um, that she kept with her all throughout, um, the day. And she'd bring it with her every single day to day program, um, out in the community. And that was just something, you know, she said when she was feeling upset or, you know, not understanding why she wasn't here, she, um, we encouraged her to take that out and, you know, look at it or put it on. Um, and then we learned about and practice different coping skills. So some of that deep breathing because when she did get upset, you know, she would, she would breathe very rapidly and, um, just kind of like that hyperventilating. Um, and so lots of, you know, deep breathing. And then, um, when she's angry, maybe, you know, go to her room or find some other, um, things that she could do, you know, to not, it, to not have those outbursts on other individuals in the house. Um, so we wanted to talk about some other ideas and ways that we can help. Um, so we talked about kind of holding space and listening, um, asking them about their um, spiritual or religious beliefs and what brings them comfort, noticing their feelings and how they might be processing their grief in the moment, um, and doing something to honor their grief and the person that passed, um, do something or let them know that what they're feeling is okay. Um, even if they're not really feeling anything, like if they're like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm not sad. Like it's okay. You know, you will feel it when you're ready. Um, a lot of times, you know, that's kind of, it might be your way of protecting yourself. Um, so when you're ready to process it, then it'll happen. And hopefully, you know, you'll have some tools to be able to deal with it. Um, suggesting therapy, providing resources and support to make it um, easier for them to be able to find help. Um, a couple of things that I've found and thought of. Um, so on TikTok, um, there was, there's this one um, page, I guess it's called at the beep. And it reminded me if you guys are familiar with um, post secret back in the day where you would write like your um, secrets or your memories or your thoughts or your feelings that are like private and then you would send it in and then they made books and then it was online um, but this is at the beep and it's like um, somebody like people calling a certain voice message and they leave a voice message and then this individual posts them on the website and the first one I saw that stuck out to me was a man who was saying how he did not want to get up that day because six weeks ago, his girlfriend had died. And he's like, I just really, you know, I'm driving home and I really don't have anybody to talk to. So I just called here and left this message. And um, so, you know, thanks. Maybe I'll do it again tomorrow. And I was like, wow, you know, like the little things that bring people comfort, you just don't know. Um, I also have a personal story about, um, so for our agency, we get cell phones that are our work phones. And um, 
the phone that I got um, apparently was a young woman's phone previously. And so a few times a year, I tend to get um, messages from a woman um, who is grieving for the loss of that person. So she'll send text messages, send videos. Um, I believe early on she had left some voice messages, but, um, you know, at first I replied and I was like, sorry, I think you have the wrong number. And she's like, no, she's like, this used to be, you know, this person's, um, phone number. She's like, is it okay if I continue to just call it? And I was like, sure. You know, if that brings you comfort, then that's fine with me. Um, so I don't respond, but you know, if that's what brings her comfort and helps her to process through that and like make her feel like she's reaching out and being able to feel more connected, then if that helps her, then that's wonderful. Um, so just like thinking of different creative ways that you can um, share, you know, experiences that other people have had, what brings people comfort, you know, and what is an idea that might be sparked with that person. Um, I know like one of the things that I've seen is, you know, a lot of people talk about either butterflies or dragonflies or, um, what is it? Cardinals, the red birds, like a lot of times, you know, those are, they're like, I know that my mom is visiting if I see a cardinal close by or, you know, certain things like that, that it helps bring like a positive memory or connection and it's comforting, you know? So, um, there's a lot of different things that comfort people. And, um, so we just can bring up those ideas and see what, um, what resonates with, um, our clients. Um, another, oh, I didn't change. Okay. Another idea, like getting creative, making a list of their memories. Um, you can write a letter to their loved one, encouraging journaling, um, creating art, photo collage, um, go to visit family if you can, and like talking about memories with that person, you know, and that can bring up more, more things. So like getting together with people who knew that person who passed away, you know, that can be very healing. Um, or reading books, watching movies, um, and sharing relatable stories to understand grief. And, you know, how did this person kind of be able to get through it? Um, and just reassuring that everything that they feel is okay. Um, and then just encouraging them to be able to talk about their feelings and um, express how they're feeling in healthy ways. And then um, just some just some resources to kind of help explore some of that grief. Um, so there's a lot of movies, um, you know, that explore grief. So um, we just listed out a few there, Marley and Me, uh, Field of Dreams, Hachi, My Girl, Steel Magnolias, Bambi, um, The Lion King. Um, and then, you know, maybe some books to start conversations about feelings. Um, so we listed a few here. Um, a Terrible Thing That Happened by Margaret Holmes, um, When Someone Dies by Andrea Dorn, and then The Memory Box by Joanna Rowland. Um, and I wanted to read just like a little excerpt um, I, I saw out of it. Um, and I just thought that it was very fitting um, based on what we've talked about, you know, um, and just kind of just a little insight as to, you know, what some of those books can entail. Um, so it says, but not as sad as I am now, I can always get another balloon, but I can have another, but I can never have another you. I miss you. I'm making a box so I won't forget you. With our memories like sand from the beach where we played and left footprints as we ran from the crashing waves. Now I'm making new memories. My first time on a roller coaster, trying a new sport, exploring a new place. I'll always share these memories with you. Some days are good. I laugh, I smile. Other days, I wonder if I'll ever stop feeling sad you're gone. But I always think of you. So many things remind me of you. Um, and so, 
And then there's also just various um, websites for worksheets and ideas. Um, so we listed those um, underneath there. Um, Karen Harvey is a great resource. Um, and then the therapist aid. Thanks, Kaylee. You made me teary. That was so pretty. I like that book. <laughs> So these are just resources and things that we use to kind of prepare for the training, the grieving brain, very interesting stuff. Um, yeah. So we're done earlier than we expected, Danielle. I know you guys flew through that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share, uh, Caitlin had typed into the, the chat box when we were talking about Cardinals that, you know, they've heard that before she's heard that before. And whenever her daughter sees one, she calls them daddy birds, which I thought was sweet, but she has also heard that in different cultures, um, spiders are believed to be ancestors and loved ones who have passed. Um, so she said her daughter no longer fears spiders because of that reason. So I thought that was super that. interesting. Um, she had also recommended, um, the book, The Invisible String, which I think Kaylee, you had talked about prior to, um, to this webinar, um, as something that's been super helpful, um, for clients. Um, we did have a couple of comments and, um, a couple questions. Let's see. Um, Diane brought up, a, she just had an interesting comment that I wanted to um, relate to you guys. And just that, um, she thinks how, how one processes and understand understands the concept of time impacts the delay of grief, which I thought was a great comment. Um, especially with, you know, a lot of the individuals that we work with um, who might struggle with the concept of time um, and how that impacts them, you know, even despite grief, just normal day-to-day -day, um, activities. So um, I thought that That's was super interesting point. to think about. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, Sherry had brought um, COVID into the, into the discussion. Um, mm -hmm. and she had asked, and I don't know if you had come across any of your research, um, when you were researching for this, um, but she was just wondering if we've seen any balance between, you know, like the depression and grief, um, since moving back into normal, you know, after COVID, you know, some people are still are able to return to day program and others just not being able to do what they used to be able to before with the lack of staff. Um, I don't know what you guys have personally experienced and if you came across any sort of research regarding that. I know that we're probably still in the early stages of researching that, um, you know, only being a year out from COVID, but um, didn't know what you, your guys' thoughts were on that. Um, I did not come across any of that. I did not specifically look at anything like COVID related specifically, um, but that's a great point. Um, but I think that definitely like you know, COVID affected everyone and it, it still affects everyone. It's changed so many things. So it totally makes sense that, you know, that would be a part of their process of like um, having those feelings of loss of a life that they used to know and the things that they used to be able to do. Yeah. Well, I think of too, I think of um, maybe the death aspect uh, involved during COVID um, mm -hmm. and people not being able to attend funerals um, mm -hmm. or even, you know, get the necessary support in not being able to physically go see a therapist um, or another mental health counselor in order to be able to process those, those things. Um, so I would be interested to see the research that comes out of this. I know that someone will research it. Um, so within the next couple of years, I assume we'll start seeing some of that. Mm -hmm. um, another question, um, Melissa had asked about um, grief that manifests um, into hoarding tendencies and other relations, uh, issues related to hoarding. Uh, I don't know if you have any insight into that. Um, well, the experiences that I've had with hoarding oftentimes, um, like I have a background of working in child welfare previously, and a lot of the kiddos that I used to work with, um, and I think a lot of our population now who have, um, you know, had kind of a, a background of probably not having much control or say over things or, abuse or neglect, then um, 
hoarding things such as food or other items can be a way of them kind of having control. Um, and that's kind of how I look at it. Um, but I mean, of course, it's different for each case. And it's hard to say, like, generally, like, not knowing a certain individual, but um, I, I always kind of think of that when um, someone's hoarding stuff that, um, and I've had individuals who would steal things, you know, things that they don't need, but it's just, you know, a way of um, kind of having that control and making sure that they have what they want. Um, so, Kaylee, did you have something? Did you have a thought? No, I I was actually going to go along the same lines that that you did. Yeah, I mean, um, and I don't really know. I mean, we didn't really come across, at least in my research when I was kind of, I didn't really come across anything um, about hoarding, but I, I wrote it down because I, I do want to see um, if I can come across anything. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, and then just some other comments that are coming through as you guys are talking. I'm trying trying to multitask and read through those. Um, uh, but so Sequoia said um, she thinks that it's it's important to learn about what the person's beliefs are in order to aid in understanding how to support them in grieving. Um, you know, for example, some people struggle less with grief when and if they believe the transitions are just part of life and that their loved ones return to them in a different form of energy. So just learning more about people's beliefs can be important um, in supporting them. Um, Yvonne brought up a good a good point in that um, she, um, in working with grief, was told by a consulting um, psychologist that they worked with um, to be careful, you know, having DSPs treat grief um, before a professional does as, you know, making a plan can sometimes be, you know, cause serious emotions to come forward and they may not be ready to deal with those emotions or know how to handle that. Um, she said that they use sometimes a one page narrative, um, especially for nonverbal folks. Mm -hmm. Let's see that um, they can have staff read. Um, so I, what I was going to mention in regards to that was I think it was important that you guys talked about, you know, what we can be doing as clinicians or as DSPs or as administration. Um, but you also provide those extra resources, um, you know, so that people can get that needed support outside of, um, you know, the, the environment that they're in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Barbara said, I'm working with children that have been sexually abused by a parent. They are struggling with the loss of that said parent. Do you have any suggestions on how to process that? Are the children, do they have developmental disabilities? Uh, she does not say. Okay. Um, oh, she said my none. Goodness. Um, yeah, I feel like that's, um, that's a lot. And I'm not really sure, you know, as far as, um, I feel like that's a specialty that's kind of outside of, you know, if you're focused mainly on like children struggling with sexual abuse, that's not necessarily something that I've um, worked with firsthand um, very often. Um, we've definitely come across clients, but um, we could like find some good resources and send them to you. Um, I know you know, we've dealt with definitely a lot of um, people struggling with sexual abuse. However, a lot of our clients are older. And um, so I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that right now. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm just trying to piece through here. Um, um, Caitlin had just um, expressed that one of one of her clients um, had a staff member who passed away from COVID. Um, so it was very difficult for them. Um, apparently other staff blamed them. Um, although that was addressed, um, you know, it he worries now because, you know, he feels like he may have caused her to pass away um, and that people, you know, um, dislike him because of that. Um, so obviously a very difficult situation. Um, I think COVID in general, um, whether death had occurred or not, uh, has definitely been 
a struggle for everyone. Yeah, I was thinking about that as you guys have been bringing up COVID, like, because even now, like, as like, we've had more cases and like Kaylee and I have some cases where we work with some very, um, you know, medically fragile individuals and then going in to visit those places and being very careful and cautious not to spread anything. And now like we're seeing these, you know, numbers increasing again. And so it's like, we don't ever want to be someone that is like bringing it in someplace that's, you know, having that guilt and that, that horrible feeling. I just feel for that individual. That's, that's a horrible thing to, to feel that you might be responsible for, for someone else's death like that. Um, Allison commented that, um, she thinks, and I would agree with this, the hardest, um, is for our nonverbal clients who, who just don't communicate well, um, and, and trying to support them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, really paying attention. Um, cause I've had a few of those, um, and it's like, you kind of see them cycle almost, um, around a certain time of the year. And then as you get to know the individual and kind of, um, interview staff and the family, then you realize, oh, this is around the time of the year that grandpa got sick. And then two months later, you know, they passed away kind of thing. Um, so, um, and that's, you know, why they're exhibiting those behaviors. Um, at least that's what I have seen, um, with some of the clients that I've worked with who were nonverbal. Um, Jenna said that, um, depending on where you are in the state, there are, um, TFCBT therapists that actually specialize in sexual assaults, um, by a parent and then losing them either through death or the abuse itself. Um, so there are definitely resources out there, um, for that specific situation. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jenna. <laughs> I am not seeing anything else. Um, let me just double check. Um, everyone was very, um, very impressed with the information that was presented today. Um, they think it was very helpful. Um, you know, this is not a topic that's necessarily discussed very often. So um, having um, any sort of resources um, has, you know, is, is very helpful for everyone. I don't see anything else. Um, so we can go ahead and, you know, end and early here, but um, we appreciate you, Katie and Kaylee, for, for sharing your knowledge um, and Thanks. being here today to present. Um, and thank you everyone else for joining us today. Um, as a reminder, you can expect your continuing education certificates um, in the next 14 days. If you don't receive it, um, please feel free to reach out to me at ddaily at hope.us. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.